Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! The Prime Minister has been meeting senior EU officials in Brussels as she tries to find a way forward for Brexit. Theresa May is seeking legally binding changes to the backstop, the insurance policy, to avoid a return of border checks in Ireland. She said she had rebuked the EU Council President Donald Tusk over his special place in hell remark that he made yesterday, aimed at those who backed Brexit without a specific plan. And she called, said she called his comments not helpful. Today, he said there was no breakthrough in sight. Our political editor, Laura Koonsberg, reports from Brussels. The Prime Minister is well used to unexpected obstacles being thrown in her path. <laughs> An anti-Brexit protester bundled away from her motorcade in Brussels. After MPs kicked out the deal she reached with the EU, her only choice is to try to keep going. Here to plead with the EU for changes, knowing already they'd say no. We must secure legally binding changes to the withdrawal agreement to deal with the concerns that Parliament has over the backstop. And taking that, changes to the backstop, together with the other work that we're doing on workers' rights and other issues, will deliver a stable majority in Parliament. The European Union very firmly keeps saying no. Now, Donald Tusk said some of your colleagues should be sent to hell in the end yesterday. Aren't you stuck in some kind of purgatory? I've raised with uh, President Tusk the language that he used yesterday, which was not helpful and caused widespread dismay in the United Kingdom. And the point I made to him is that we should both be working to ensure that we can deliver a close relationship between the United Kingdom and the European Union in the future, and that's what he should be focusing on. Behind closed doors, of course, both sides hope there can be a deal. They want this to work. But look at how her expression changes once in front of the public. As a cabinet minister said, this situation is grim. Theresa May wants to change the deal they shook hands on before Christmas because it can't get past MPs. That's down to the so-called backstop, that guarantee against a hard border in Ireland. Brussels top brass say no breakthrough. The EU27 will not reopen the withdrawal agreement. The discussion was robust but constructive. Despite the challenges, the two leaders agreed that their teams should hold talks. Hey, there is well so negotiations are back on. There'll be many more handshakes and hellos. But if Brexiteers at home believe there'll be a farewell to the backstop, well... Uh, Mrs May today in the meeting uh, assured us that uh, uh, there will be a backstop. But is the way out of the hole back at home? Labour's infuriated many of its own side by showing willing, publishing five demands for the deal. Legal promises on security, the single market free trade area, customs and workers' rights. Jeremy Corbyn's not about to sign up for the deal, but he too wants to talk. A lot of our manufacturing industries are very frightened and very worried at the moment that on the 29th of March there'll be a cliff edge. There cannot be a cliff edge. We will do everything we can in Parliament to prevent this cliff edge exit. So now Labour says it wants to compromise, the EU wants to keep talking. But the truth is, Theresa May at the moment won't budge to meet the opposition. The EU shows little sign of moving to meet her. So as the clock goes down, the pressure on the Prime Minister goes up and up. And although just keeping going doesn't sound a cunning strategy, right now, perhaps, it's the only one she's got. All along, this has been a process of small, tricky forward moves. A grand finale could be a long wait yet. Laura Kunzberg, BBC News, Brussels. Our Europe editor, Katia Adler, is in Brussels. Did anything really change today? Well, no, Sophie, not in terms of substance. Both sides took up their well-rehearsed, entrenched positions. The Prime Minister's main declared aim here today was to get legally binding changes to the backstop guarantee on the Irish border. And the EU once again said no, that the withdrawal agreement signed off by the Prime Minister in November, which contains the text on the backstop, could not and would not be reopened. An EU official very close to today's talks told me that the Prime Minister did not put any concrete proposal on the table today as to how she saw agreements going forward. Uh,
and uh, and excuse me um in stark contrast there was extreme excitement in the EU side about a proposal put forward by Jeremy Corbyn to try and find cross-party support in Westminster for a softer Brexit. No surprise there. The Prime Minister's plan may be to try and run down the clock in order to get some last-minute concessions. A new round of EU-UK negotiations have now been announced till the end of the month, essentially kicking the can down the road. But if anyone's looking for concessions, it's the EU too. Our Europe editor, Katia Adler, thank you. The Bank of England has warned that it expects the UK economy to grow at its slowest rate for a decade. It revised its growth forecast for this year from 1.7 to 1.2 per cent. The bank's governor, Mark Carney, blamed it on uncertainty over the UK's departure from the EU, what he called the fog of Brexit, as well as a global slowdown. Here's our economics correspondent, Darshini David. Tell us why you came back to Birmingham then. Because um, I have a lot of history here, to be honest. Lizzie is one of the record 32 and a half million people in work. But, like many, she's not having an easy time. I don't even make 12 grand a year. I do have tips, which obviously helps, but it, it's, without sounding dramatic, it's exhausting. It is. I constantly count out my pennies, constantly trying to work out if I, yeah. It's really, really hard work. She's hoping for a better future. But the Governor of the Bank of England doesn't have good news. The outlook for growth and inflation also depends heavily on the extent to which Brexit uncertainties evolve. Uncertainty about the outcome of negotiations obviously has intensified since November, and it's now weighing more heavily on activity, predominantly through lower business investment and tighter financial conditions. When you look at the heightened uncertainty, it does suggest a potentially quite a big knock on growth this year and next. How could that impact on households too? That uncertainty is affecting the economy at present. We see it across the board in businesses. We're starting to see it creep into the housing market. We're seeing it in household spending. Since the dip of the financial crisis, the economy has been expanding at a pretty decent rate. Now, the bank says, even if a Brexit deal is struck, 2019 could see the weakest growth in a decade before a pickup. Ten years ago this week, the Bank of England cut interest rates to just 1% to deal with the financial crisis. The fact they haven't been back above that level since is a sign of how fragile prosperity has been. Now, the bank says that growth could be slowing even further thanks to prolonged uncertainty over Brexit and weaker demand from places like Europe. In fact, it thinks there's a one in four chance the economy could actually shrink by the autumn. Brexit is only part of the story. So we're operating in a global economic environment where China um, is slowing down, where the US has been um, softer on interest rate policy, so is Australia, so is Canada, so is India. And there are a lot of uncertainties out there. But a disruptive Brexit could be the biggest headache for business and the Bank of England. It may have to choose between raising interest rates to keep a lid on prices or cutting them to protect spending and jobs. Doshini David, BBC News. Still no breakthrough in sight. Donald Tusk's verdict after his meeting with Theresa May in Brussels this afternoon. The Prime Minister looked stony-faced in the posed photographs, saying she'd had words with the European Council President over his remarks about leading Brexiteers here, deserving a special place in hell. Mrs May insisted she was still determined to deliver Brexit on time, but the only agreement which was actually reached today to hold more talks before the end of this month. Our political editor, Gary Gibbon, has this. Following in the Irish Prime Minister's footsteps, Theresa May toured the institutions of the European Union in Brussels today. The European Parliament, the European Council President Donald Tusk, and a meeting with the European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker. They agreed their teams would meet for more talks. Well, that was about all they agreed. Crucially, President Juncker and I have agreed that talks will now uh, start to find a way through this, to find a way to get this over the line and to deliver on the concerns that Parliament has so we get a majority in Parliament. After his meeting with Theresa May, Donald Tusk tweeted, still no breakthrough in sight. Theresa May told the EU with the right changes to the withdrawal agreement, she could get a majority in the Commons to back a Brexit deal. Mr Juncker's spokesman said that wasn't on offer. President Juncker 
underlined that the EU27 will not reopen the withdrawal agreement. What could be on offer are assurances already given but put into legal form. She can say she's got, remote, she's got some reassurance that the backstop is, on a, is legally cannot be forever and she can say she's got reassurances that the role of technology will be considered in a fair and objective process. So if, the, if Tory backbenchers are looking for a ladder to climb down before they cease their opposition to May's plan, she will provide them a ladder, but it's a rather small and shaky ladder. Overnight, a photo of the Labour leader at his desk was released, signing off a letter to Theresa May suggesting the two agree on a Brexit plan. The changes Labour would need to see in the Brexit plan include, he wrote, a permanent and comprehensive UK-wide customs union and close alignment with the EU single market. My colleagues and I look forward to discussing these proposals with you further, he wrote. Pro-Corbyn, pro-EU activists bit back. As a member, I don't think we'll forgive the Labour Party for enabling a Tory Brexit and for keeping the government in power. What we should be campaigning for, rightly, is a general election and also another referendum. All of us agree that Labour government... He really will wants to press that button, the second referendum button, Jeremy Corbyn. The party is more than one person. The promise of Corbynism always was about giving more power to the members of the party. And I think the members are fairly united on not wanting to back a Tory deal. The party's Brexit spokesman, Matthew Pennycook, tweeted, either Theresa May accepts the Labour plans in full or we must move to support a public vote. The leadership then slapped that down party would not automatically, it said, switch to supporting the second referendum if the cross-party Brexit deal doesn't happen. Will some Labour MPs be scratching their heads wondering what's the point of being in this party? Our voice has been snuffed out. Uh, well, put it this way, uh, I think if you've got members who are resigning or who are writing and emailing MPs saying this is it, uh, we didn't expect the Labour Party to be complicit in Brexit, um, do I understand their views? Absolutely I do. And to be quite frank about it, my patience is wearing very thin with this whole situation. On her tour of Brussels, one anti-Brexit demonstrator got too close to the Prime Minister's car and was wrestled away. The Prime Minister said she was still determined to deliver Brexit on time in 49 days. Even though she has no new plan and piles of legislation, she still needs to get through Parliament. It's very far-fetched, isn't it? So we have already hit the buffers. There is no way the legislation required by the Brexit date can be got through. We're looking at delay. I think everybody is now looking day by day more realistically at the prospect of extending the Article 50 period. But of Nobody's course, really saying it, are they? <laughs> well, perhaps the uh, voices will get louder over the coming days. It's reported that at their meeting, Donald Tusk told Theresa May Jeremy Corbyn's proposal might be a promising way out of her difficulties. Her response isn't known, but can be guessed at. Joining us now from Cardiff is the Labour MP, Owen Smith. Owen Smith, the word complicit was used by one of your colleagues. Is Labour now assisting, or Mr Corbyn at least, assisting Mrs May to deliver her deal? Well, that's what many of us fear is going to be the end point for all of this, and that's why we are worried by the letter that came out today, because whilst on the face of it, it may be a, a move in the right direction towards a softer Brexit, it looks to me to be pretty unlikely that Theresa May is going to take that option. And most worryingly of all, it ignores what Labour members agreed on at our party conference, which was <clears throat> if we couldn't have a general election, and of course that looks extremely unlikely, we ought to be pursuing a, another public vote, a vote for the people to ratify the Brexit deal. And unfortunately that is uh, s s missing from the letter from Jeremy Corbyn. But back in uh, 2017, the, the Labour Party manifesto uh, said it accepted the outcome of the referendum. And I think the facts have changed since then. I think we now know that, to an even greater extent than we did previously, that Brexit was sold to the country on a lie, that the uh, Leave campaign were deceitful and cheated in the way in which they prosecuted the campaign. And all of the promises that were made, whether that was to do with more money for public services or the ease of being able to do trade deals once we left the EU, all of those promises have been shown to be completely false and empty. So what we've got left before us is the prospect of a Brexit deal that is going to make people in my constituency and Jeremy's constituency right across this country poorer and which is fundamentally at odds with the deep-seated Labour values that I know many in 
our movement currently feel are being left to one side in order to pursue this Brexit deal alongside the Tories? Well, what would you do as a Labour MP um, if, in the end, you know, uh, he helps deliver Brexit? Well, I think I would feel that that was a betrayal of my values. I think the Labour Party has always been about uh, looking after people in this country, growing our economy in order to share the proceeds of that growth equitably, more equitably under Labour than under, under any other government. And we know that this Brexit, any Brexit, but this Brexit, this hard Brexit currently being pursued by the Prime Minister will make our uh, economy immeasurably smaller. It will make everybody in this country poor. It will cost us in jobs and opportunities. And how on earth can the Labour Party be supporting that? How on earth can we be saying we want to be into government but we're accepting that we're going to be hamstrung in government with lesser risk tax receipts and lesser ability to uh, share the wealth more equitably in this country? That's at odds with Labour values. And the underpinning ideology behind Brexit, that nativist, xenophobic, uh, nostalgic ideology, that is also at odds with the Labour Party's values. The well, reason we believed in uh, the EU is because it's about helping people right across the European Union and helping people at home. Why has that changed since 2016 and why aren't we being more honest about what we truly believe in and therefore opposing Brexit? Well, that, that's very clear stuff. If it wasn't me talking to you but Jeremy Corbyn, would you tell him that you'd leave the party under those circumstances? Well, I, I've said today that I think if uh, people like me who believe that Brexit is totally at odds with our values, that it is enabling racism in our country, that it is underpinning the Tories, that it's more likely to lead to another Tory government and give that Tory government an excuse to cut back on workers' rights and wages and opportunity for working people in constituencies like Pontypridd. If that's where we're going, what on earth are we doing as a Labour Party? So at the moment I'm going to fight that fight within the movement. I'm going to say we should be asking for a people's vote, whatever the Brexit deal at the end of this, because that is the democratic thing to do, and it's right. the only way in which we give the country a chance to pull back from the Brexit brink, uh, but equally we need to be clear about people that any Brexit is bad right. for our country and at odds with Labour's views. Owen Smith, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Ferry company with no ferries might be stranded in a port that isn't a port. Running new services from Ramsgate was the government's big idea to relieve the pressure on Dover in the event of a no-deal Brexit. But councillors there are meeting tonight to decide whether to make a series of budget cuts they go through, it might make all that impossible. Our business editor, Siobhan Kennedy, is at the Department of Transport. Siobhan. Fatima, you'll remember that Seaborn Freight was one of three companies that was quietly awarded a no-deal ferry contract on Christmas Eve to run emergency services, food and medicines from Europe to the UK in the event of a no-deal. Now, Seaborn's contract was immediately contra controversial because it turns out they were a ferry company with no ferries. And, um, the, pro and what the problem now is that there may be no port either, and that is because Thanet District, which runs the port of Ramsgate, is pushing through a budget this evening and simply cannot afford to keep the port, which is being mothballed, up and running. Can't afford to keep it operational. Now, they had hoped to sign a contract with Seaborn, um, to sign a contract to get the money flowing in. But as of this evening, that has not happened. And as we speak, the councillors are voting in Thanet to push those cuts through. And if they do, then the port within hours could soon be not operational. Well, this is all very embarrassing for the government, Siobhan. What are they saying? Well, it is. Chris Grayling has faced a lot of criticism over this Seaborn contract, not least from MPs who have highlighted revelations on this programme about the boss of Seaborn Freight, Ben Sharp, and his previous business dealings. Now, Chris Grayling has always stood by Seaborn and said simply that if the service is not up and running on time, then we won't pay them. That is not what he is saying tonight. There seems to be an admission 
that things are not going well. The language around this contract has become much more speculative. Listen to this. They are saying we continue to have conversations with a number of stakeholders, including Thanet Council, over any plans to re-establish ferry services at the port of Ramsgate. Now, that is hardly a statement that is brimming with confidence. And it does seem tonight that in the absence of a contract or ferries, and any minute now, perhaps a port as well, that this particular leg of Chris Grayling's emergency no-deal ferry services does seem very close to being dead in the water. Fatima. Extraordinary. Thanks, Siobhan. John. Well, now the fog of Brexit is increasing the chances of recession, the Bank of England governor has warned, as he slashed the UK's growth forecast to its weakest for 10 years. The bank said that endless uncertainty over the Brexit negotiations meant that companies are hunkering down and cutting investment, although it did not hold out the hope of a recovery late this year if an orderly deal is negotiated about that. should have read, I'm sorry. He did hold out uh, a hope that there would be a recovery if there is an ordered departure. Our economics correspondent, Helia Ebrahimi, has this report. Helia. Today, the Bank of England delivered the worst forecast for UK growth since the financial crisis. Brexit uncertainty, it said, was damaging the economy more than expected. Now, even with an orderly Brexit, the bank admits there's a one in four chance of a recession by summer. This is a time of quite considerable uncertainty um, about one of the most important issues, the most important issue facing uh, this economy. We see it across the board in businesses. We're starting to see it creep into the housing market. We're seeing it in household spending. For 2019, the bank had expected growth of 1.7%. Now that's cut to 1.2%, the lowest pace of growth since 2009. Even in a soft Brexit scenario where the government manages to strike a deal, the bank concedes there's a one in four chance of recession. And already, the governor says Britain's economy has lost £30 billion compared to where forecasts before the referendum expected the country to be. As Theresa May goes on another last-minute dash to Europe, her 24th since Article 50 was triggered, the governor lamented that with just seven weeks left till Brexit Day, time was running out for negotiations. I would have described no deal, no transition uh, a few years ago as a low-probability event. Um, I describe it now as not the central scenario. In other words, the probability has gone up. As just one example, Half the businesses in the latest survey by the bank's agents are not ready for such a possibility. And on balance, respondents expect output, employment and investment to contract substantial, substantially if it were to occur. The governor made repeated references to the health of British businesses and how hard Brexit headwinds were for companies across the UK. The report highlighted that for a third consecutive quarter, Business investment was down, stalling overall economic progress. And with a negative shock to the economy like No Deal, companies have told the bank there would be a sizable hit to employment. Governor, today the bank... While the pound slumped on the back of the bank's projections, the governor, often accused of being commander-in-chief of Project Fear, made a big show of stressing the bank's continued faith that in the end there would be a deal and as a result an economic bounce. Our central view of the MPC is that in a transition to an average outcome, a form of soft Brexit if you will, um, that this economy is going to pick up, um, firms are going to hire, uh, they're going to invest, productivity is going to pick up, real wages are going to pick up, inflation which we care about is going to, uh, uh, is going to pick up um, and we're going to move forward. Uh, so that's the core, if, if, if you know, you're watching uh, Channel 4 uh, tonight, that's the core thing. That's the expectation. Like the economy, the governor has had to negotiate the Brexit minefield over the last two and a half years. And sometimes the stress can sneak out from even the most polished of performances. A giggle at the end when asked if he regretted staying in the job when he woke up in the morning. Uh, yeah, I don't wake up in the morning anymore. I wake up in the middle of the night. Well, we are watching Channel 4 News and you're on it live. Uh, Helia, where does this leave 
interest rates. Well, John, in the paradox of monetary policy, more bad news today means the Bank of England's plans to raise interest rates once a year for the next three years will be now cut to just once. Now, for households that already feel under pressure, this is light relief. But another point, John, that I want to make is that while today's downgrade from the Bank of England was focused on Brexit, it's not all about domestic problems. The global economy is stalling, and nowhere more so than Europe. Germany narrowly missed recession, and Italy is smack bang in it. And that has a huge impact on us. Hello, Ibrahimi. Well, now back to tonight's main news and the latest Brexit developments. And in Manchester, the Labour shadowed Northern Ireland Secretary, Tony Lloyd. Tony Lloyd, it seems uh, Mr Corbyn has decided to try and prop Mrs May up in her desperate bid. No, uh, look, we, we've been very worried that uh, Theresa May has been running down the, the Brexit clock. Um, all the way through this, she's kept her own card so tight to, to her chest that not even her cabinet knows what's going on. We've got to break through this. What Jeremy Corbyn has done is to state uh, where Labour is, uh, that we, and, but in fact where the nation needs to be. If we're going to be faithful to that no hard border across the island of Ireland, but if we're going to have uh, everything we can do to make sure that our goods and services flow with our, uh, to, to, from our major trading partner in the European Union, Labour has got to take the initiative. Um, what we want is, is Theresa May now, if she comes back from Brussels and can't assemble the deal that she's trying to do within her, her own party and with, of course with the DUP, and that seems unlikely unless the DUP and the ERG group stand on the head. Well, I've just been if speaking to... Uh, deal I've just been... Then... Yeah, but I've just been speaking to Owen Smith uh, down in Cardiff, and, I mean, he's in despair. Mm. He, he says this is going in completely the wrong direction. I mean, one of the points, surely, is that the referendum itself is now nearly three years old. The country has changed dramatically. The evidence of what is going to happen, nobody knew any of this stuff. Why are you prepared to blind ahead? Well, we're not blinding ahead, rather the opposite, actually. What uh, Jeremy Corbyn laid out in his letter today is exactly the opposite. What we had from the Prime Minister when she brought back her political declaration was exactly your words, blinding ahead, a blind Brexit that uh, could have been Canada minus, Norway plus for those who followed these things. What we've set out is something that's, that is compatible with uh, keeping the, the trade flowing across those borders without restriction. It will make sure, in particular, that there is no hard border across Northern Ireland. It will make sure things that she should have negotiated in the withdrawal agreement, uh, uh, the European arrest warrant, for example, our membership of, uh, of some of the European institutions like the European Medicine Agency, those will be there for, for us in the long run. These are really important things for the people of Britain. We can't dally any longer. Well, what, um, what, that's but, why Jeremy is trying to say, we'll see... There are people now leaving your party. It is said that up to 100,000 members have left. You're languishing in the polls. This is not what your members want. Momentum in particular. Much blame for this and that, but actually very pro-European. You're not singing the song the party seems to want to hear. Well, John, the, we're singing the, the, the tune that the country needs to hear because, look, in the end, if Theresa May can't erect a deal on her own terms with the, uh, her own uh, the Conservative party, the DUP, then either she has got to move towards uh, embracing the rest of Parliament or Parliament will have to seize control from Theresa May. What Jeremy Corbyn has laid out is something that we can test in Parliament, see whether there's a consensus of that, and of course that's right and proper. We've now got to move on to the alternatives, and the right. alternatives that can offer a future to this country, not the blind Brexit that we've had on offer so far. Tony Lloyd from Manchester, thank you very much indeed for talking to us. I've been